Well, good morning, everybody. Oh, come on now. Good morning, everybody. I have a question. Does anybody in the house love Jesus? <laughs> I believe you. Can we put our hands together at Lakewood Ranch and welcome all of our family that's joining us online, all of our campuses, all of our family in the jails. Thank you guys for joining us today. What a privilege and honor it is to stand before you to bring the word of God. We are in a series called Bold Faith. For those of you that have never met me before, I am the Dark Shepherd, a.k.a. Bernard Scott. That's right, I gave my name, I gave myself the name Dark Shepherd. Years ago, I thought I was going to be a pro wrestler, so that was going to be my stage name. But I don't slam people, I slam demons now. So that's what I do. So I am honored and privileged to share the word with you today. And in this series, last week, Pastor Randy talked about Gideon. And this week, I'm going to talk about Rahab. But before I get into the message today, I believe God has a, me- a word for us, but I want to read a portion, opening portion of scripture found in Hebrews chapter 11. That portion of scripture, that chapter is called, it's really the hall of fame. This is where all of the great people throughout the scripture who display great faith, they're acknowledged and recognized. And so as I open up this with this portion of scripture, I always ask for us to stand to honor God's word. Why is that? Because I believe in our in our world today, a lot of honors is being thrown out the window. And where you see it, it's people are standing to honor our nation or our military or whatever the case may be, and that's all great. I love that. But I believe the word of God is worth honor as it is the one thing that can transform a life. Amen? <clears throat> so I'm going to read verse 1 through 3, and then I'm going to read verse 30 and 31. What is faith? This is out of the Living Bible. It is the confident assurance that something we want is going to happen. It is the certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us, even though we cannot see it up ahead. Men of God in days of old were famous for their faith. By faith, by believing God, we know that the world and the stars, in fact, all things were made at God's command and that they were all made from things that can't be seen. It was faith that brought the walls of Jericho tumbling down after the people of Israel had walked around them seven days as God had commanded them by faith. Because she believed in God and his power, Rahab the harlot did not die with all, those, uh, with all the others in her city when they refused to obey God, for she gave a friendly welcome to the spies. Father, it's in this moment that I welcome your spirit. Reveal your truth. Open our hearts and our ears to receive your truth. And as we encounter it, may we be transformed into the people that you've created and redeemed us to be. Remove every hindrance and every distraction. May your truth set us free. In Christ's name, and everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Rahab, the harlot. It's interesting because when you look at Rahab, I'm I'm going to give you a little bit of history, but it's always attached this title, this job that she had, the harlot. But I'm going to start where, you know, Moses has now died and he was the leader of Israel and Joshua takes over. Joshua now hits his calling to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. So Joshua sends out uh, two spies because their first the first thing they got to do as they're headed towards the promised land is encounter a land, the land of Canaan. And there was a city called Jericho, which was kind of like the, the center point of just the, the historians have described Jericho as being this defiled place where so many practices of, of idol worship and temple prostitution and human trafficking and just you name it. It was really a picture of what's really happening today in our world. It was a lot of darkness in the city. So Joshua sends two spies. These two spies show up at the house of Rahab, the harlot. The king finds out that these spies are in the land. Now, when you read the portion of scripture, I I would always stop there because I'm going, the king finds out these spies were there and sends spies to Rahab's house. They must not have been good spies because the king finds out and he knows exactly where to find them. But Rahab hides the spies and uh, on on the roof under some flax and 
she lies to the soldiers and tells them that the guys were here, but they're gone. They, they, you know, they went on somewhere. So these soldiers go looking for them. And then after they leave, she goes and she tells the spy, she says, look, I've heard what your God has done for you. I know that he has delivered you out of Egypt. I know that he helped you cross the Red Sea. She begins to tell them all these things that God did for them. And he says, I know that he, she says, I know that he's given you this city. So I'm asking one thing, that you would spare my life, but also spare my family's life because I don't want to, to die and I want my whole, my whole family to be spared. So uh, the spies tell her, well, because you've done this good thing, we'll, this is what you do, get your family here and if you get all your family in this house and you hang out this scarlet rope outside your window, then we will come and we will spare your family. Now, if they're not inside your house, their blood is on your hands. But if they're in your house and something happens to them, their blood will be on ours. So you read the rest of the story. Of course, um, they go away and the children of Israel approach the city. Joshua tells them to walk around the city seven times. It walks around seven times. The walls come crumbling down, except for Rahab and her family. They're spared. And then she goes on to live with the children of Israel. That's the story. That's the context. And there's some lessons within this story that I want to, I think that we can glean from today that will help us as we talk about bold faith. Everybody say bold faith. All right, here's the first lesson. Bold faith requires godly fear. Bold faith requires godly fear. Now, when I say godly fear, I'm not talking about fear that the world gives you. When we hear that word, we naturally think worldly fear, where I'm so afraid, I'm terrified, I'm petrified, uh, uh, and it's an unhealthy fear. I'm, I'm talking about a godly fear, an understanding that God is God. In, in Joshua uh, chapter 2, verse 9, she tells the spies, I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We're all afraid of you. They have this natural fear. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know that you, what you did to Sihon and Gog, Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things, for the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. The people in Canaan, they had an ungodly fear. They were terrified. But Rahab had a godly fear, and she begins to tell them why she has this fear, and her faith was based on evidence. And this evidence that she had was what she knew and what she heard. Notice that not only Rahab, not only did she fear the Israelites because of what they heard, but the whole city now is afraid because they heard of all of these things. But their fear was different than Rahab's. Rahab's fear led to action on her part. The godly fear that she had gave her access to wisdom that said, you better choose between culture or God because the people that are coming to destroy this city are being sent by God and I promise you, he's never lost a battle and he never will. So she went from just knowing what God did to knowing God. Many people will in this life, they will, because they go to church, they have a knowledge of God. But just because you're sitting in this room or where, whatever room you're sitting in doesn't necessarily mean that you have a relationship with him. You can have a knowledge but not a knowing. And how do I know this? Life has an interesting way of throwing us curveballs. Life has a way of throwing us tests and trials and tribulations and all of these things. And if you don't know God, when I say know God, I mean have a knowledge that he is the greatest. He is the undefeated, undisputed champion of the universe. He always will be. He is the great I am. He is the greatest one ever, right? So if you don't have that knowledge, you will exalt your trial over God. 
If you don't have this intimate knowledge that he's a deliverer, you will allow your pain to dictate your identity. If you don't have this knowledge of God, you will allow your test, instead of it becoming a testimony, you will allow it to take you to places that you never wanted to go. But if you know God, this knowledge of him, there's a fear, a reverence that comes over you that says, God is God. He brings life, he brings death, and I can stare my circumstance in the, in the face, and I may hurt, and I may feel pain, but I know that in the end I win because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I serve a God who says, I'm not going to lose. I'm going to win because he's made me to be more than a conqueror. Woo, boy, Bernard, you just go ahead and preach that word. I'm feeling that. You got to transition from knowing to believing. Many heard but didn't respond, but Rahab heard, and she responded, and she made a deal with these spies. Hey, look, I know it's about to go down, so spare my life. Spare my family's life. I want you to know this. Every opportunity to fear is also an opportunity to trust God. Every opportunity to fear is also an opportunity to trust God. I'm sure that she felt fear knowing that they were coming, But that fear was an opportunity to trust the same God that delivered the children of Israel. Godly fear simply means to recognize the immense power of God and to recognize ourselves as insignificant in comparison to him. That in spite of our insignificance and despite of our imperfection, This God has a master plan and he uses imperfection. He uses our failures. He uses all of that to turn it around for our good because his purposes and plans. He says, I sent forth my word and what I sent forth it to do, it will accomplish every single thing I said. And he's the only God that can say something and back it up. So for this reason, he deserves all reverence and honor. There's a holy fear in Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 15, says, wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord and humility comes before honor. Proverbs 10, 27 says, fear of the Lord lengthens one's life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. Proverbs 14, 27 Fear of the Lord is a life-giving fountain. It offers escape from the snares of death. Our Father doesn't want us to live with just a worldly fear because he hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the wisest man known during this time, Solomon, he says this, now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the duty of of all mankind. So this first lesson is to have this godly fear, bold faith. If you want faith, bold, bold faith. I'm not talking about, because every man is given a measure of faith, is what the scripture says, but bold faith says, now I know who God is. And because I know who he is, people have asked me so many times, how do you have so much joy? Why is there a smile? And, And what they don't realize is I have such joy and such a great smile because I've been through something. That's the only reason why. I shouldn't have joy, what the world says. I I shouldn't have a smile. I, I, I shouldn't be so happy, but I am because I've been through something. And I've seen the faithfulness of God. We're all in this room because God has delivered us somehow, some way, in some circumstance in our life. He's been faithful. That's why we're here. But we persevered. Here's the second lesson. Bold faith leads to action. Bold faith leads to action. James chapter 2 in verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, by faith itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, 
it is dead and useless. And then in verse 25 of that same chapter, it says, Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Now, it's interesting because Rahab, she heard of God's exploits. She knew of God's exploits. But the difference between her and the rest of the city is she did something about what she knew and what she heard. She took a step of having bold faith, not just sitting in a room saying, I am a person of faith. I have bold faith, and my bold faith is uh, her decision was I'm going to partner with God in these spies. Uh, Now, how she partnered with God, I wouldn't champion. She lied. And many people have used this passage to justify lying. Don't lie. Lying ain't good. Because God really, he, that's a whole other thing. But you got to remember where she was coming from, all right? She's a harlot, and she had a lifestyle, but she knew one thing. I'm going to partner and hide these guys, even if I got to lie to spare my life. And so she lied, and God used her weakness to still get his, weak, his, his promise to happen. So it's never right to, to lie, just so, you, so that y'all know. In fact, Proverbs 12, says, the Lord detests lying lips. He delights in those who tell the truth. Now, her bold faith caused her to take action. And in that action, I want you to know God will use our imperfections to still advance his kingdom purpose. I don't know about you, but that brings me a whole whole lot of grace and a whole lot of excitement. Because standing before you is a big old six foot three, 200 something pound guy (laughs) with a whole lot of imperfection. But God is still using me. He uses your imperfections to advance his kingdom. Rahab had a whole lot of imperfections. Can you imagine your entire legacy, your label? as Rahab the harlot. In every portion of scripture, in Hebrews, in Matthew, in James, in Joshua, it's, she's referred to as Rahab the harlot, which leads me to lesson number three. Bold faith is not defined by past failures. Bold faith is not defined by past failures. Rahab's story illustrates that God's purpose is not limited to your past. There's no sin too great for God to not forgive. He's a very merciful God. He's a kind and loving God. And throughout the Bible, we've seen many descriptions of his undying mercy towards people. In fact, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We've seen that Rahab, she's known by this being a harlot all throughout the scriptures. Speaking of that, it's, it's kind of a funny story, sad story, and also an awesome story. And so bear with me as I tell you. For 10 years, I served as a um, chaplain for a juvenile detention center. And it was a full-on lockdown facility. And um, I ministered for 10, 10 years there. And I was teaching the guys about Rahab's story in one particular night. And I always taught with the, they can ask me anything. And it was a safe place for them to ask questions. And one of the guys asked me, one of the young men asked me, he says, yo, yo, Pastor V, um, what's a harlot? And I looked, thought he was trying to disrupt the class, be funny. I was like, um, it's a woman of the night. He's like, woman of the night? Oh, well. A uh, prostitute. He's like, a hoe? And I was like, yeah, yeah, she was a hoe. He's like, why didn't you just say that? And I was like, um, well, and then he says that he, go on, he goes on to say, he goes, my mom was a hoe. I'm like, dude, that ain't nice. Don't be talking about your mama like that. He's like, no, for real. I don't even know who my daddy is. And I went, ooh. Then he asked me this question that just broke my heart. He said, Pastor B, after I was done teaching this message about Rahab, he said, will my mama make it to heaven? 
And I was like, Phew. Jesus died for every single person that believes in him. He died for everybody. All you got to do, if your mama makes that choice, that decision, he said, well, how she's gonna, how's she going to make that decision? She's just trying to provide. She's, you know, he's going through all this. I said, look, I said, let's talk about your life. And we're going to start praying for your mama. So we did. We prayed for her. And then uh, it was, I was very blessed that uh, I asked for permission. They, they said it never happened in the state of Florida. And I asked permission if I can bring pools into this facility and baptize these men that had started trust, these young men that started trusting Christ. They allowed me to bring these pools in and we baptized. We had a baptism service, right? <laughs> and this is what's so cool. Um, we would call whatever relatives um, we could find. We'd call them and say, hey, we're having a special event. We'd like to invite you to the facility to come and see your son and also to partake of their, you know, their participate as they get baptized. Well, we called his mom. She came. God touched her so much watching her son get baptized, she wanted to get baptized. She gave her life to Christ, got baptized in the same facility that her son was locked up in. His prayer was answered that his mama, who he called a hoe, made it, gonna make it to heaven with him. Don't tell me God doesn't look at your past and be, is moved by your past. He can turn your search or situation around where you don't have to be identified by what you've done or what mistakes you've made. He doesn't care about all that. He looks at the heart and he says, I made a way for you to come to me. So don't allow your past to limit my grace in your life. No sin is greater than God's mercy. The plan of God is greater than your failures. But you've got to make a decision. Am, am I aligning myself with culture or am I aligning with God? I, I can't allow my past to hold me back, but God can take your past and propel you into something that is great. But you've got to start allowing the precious blood of Jesus Christ and his spirit to destroy the lies that have been exalted and resurrected in your life. And those lies, are they're, they're, they're telling you that you're not worthy. They're, they're telling you that your prayers are, are hitting a ceiling. Those, those lies are telling you that you'll never be good enough. Those lies are telling you that you're not worthy of love. And I'm here to break and dismantle every single one of those lies and let you know that you are loved and no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. It cannot prosper. Why? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the truth is, God specializes in the impossible. She asks, can you take my family too? Can you please protect my family? Here's my first point, my fourth one and as I close, because God is not limited by your past or present. He uses it. But my fourth lesson today is that bold faith changes legacy. Bold faith changes legacy. <laughs> um, Rahab wasn't the only Canaanite. And just let me pause here for a second because the Spirit of God is just speaking to me about somebody in this room. And I just want to hear him clearly so that I can speak to you. I'm just going to just pause here for a second from my, from my message. There's somebody that um, over and over again you hear, it's almost like a broken record, words that were spoken over you by your earthly father. And every time you try to take a bold faith and a step forward in your life, you keep repeating a cycle because you keep hearing this word. And I don't, I don't know what the phrase was that was spoken over you. But right now you've been asking God to, to stop the noise. And I want you to know today, he's gonna silence that noise and you're gonna hear his voice clearly for maybe the first time in your life and it's gonna set a new trajectory for you. 
in Jesus' name. I believe that. Okay. So back to the message. Joshua uh, chapter 2. Rahab in verse 12. She says to these spies, now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. Now, I think it's very interesting because with her lifestyle, she could have easily just made it about her, just rescuing her life. But she didn't just go about trying to rescue her life. She says, no, 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 save my entire family. Now, I don't know about you, but you may have family members that aren't necessarily towing the line or living right or, or you're ashamed of. And, and when, you, when you have somebody that has a lifestyle, imagine, she's a prostitute. You know she had family members doing this. I can't believe she, you know, she's living all like that. You know how that happens. You, please don't do that. If you, ever, if you got family members like that, listen, she said, I want my whole family to be saved. I want my whole family to be saved. The lesson I learned in that is don't ever give up on your family. Once you know God and you know the truth and you've heard and you know that you know that you know who God is and you're praying for that wayward son or daughter or you're praying for that lost loved one or you're praying for that sick, just the relational issues, I want you to never give up. Keep praying, keep interceding. Don't underestimate the power of your intercession. Keep standing and having done all to stand, stand and pray and believe and declare and speak life, guidance, love over your family member. Don't ever, ever give up on them because God, as long as they're breathing, God is not finished. So Joshua chapter two, verse 15, after she spoke with the spies, It says here, she let them down by a rope. Everybody say rope. Through a window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. And she said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days. Everybody say three days. Until they return and then go on your way. This word rope in verse 15 is the Hebrew word. I'm going to give you a little bit of... uh, Teaching, some Hebrew teaching here. So, shevel, this is the Hebrew word. It actually means pain, sorrow, travail, a noose, a snare, a portion, or a lot. What's incredible about the Hebrew language is each word or letter, it tells a story. It's not just a word. It's like a whole story in, in these words. And that word shevel, this, this rope, it means pain, sorrow, travail. So, she lets them down through the window on this rope. Now, You go on in verse 17, it says, Now the men had said to her, This oath you have made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and your mother and your brothers and all your family into your house. Everybody say scarlet cord. So there's a rope. Hanging out her window, these guys climb down the window. They go, this rope, the rope that they climb down is telling a story of Rahab's pain, her sorrow, her disconnection, her portion, her her lot. It's telling a story. And these spies climb down that rope. And then they, they go away for three days. There's someone else we know that went away for three days. He died, he was buried. Three days later, he rose again and he came and delivered us and saved us. So then these spies tell her, hang this scarlet rope out your window because when we come back, this is the only way we're gonna know not to touch your house. And everybody that's in your house will be protected because we see the scarlet rope. We won't destroy anybody that's in your house. (laughs) So they come back, and of course, they're marching around the city. And I imagine Jericho, as they're looking at the Israelites, instead of just attacking them, they're marching around Jericho, worshiping God, marching around Jericho, worshiping God. And 
Jericho, they're probably mocking them. And every time the children of Israel walked around, seven times it says, I'm sure they got to that part of the wall where they see the scarlet thread hanging out. And the seventh time, the walls come crashing down. The city is destroyed, except Rahab and her family. Why? Because of this scarlet rope. You may be tied to something in your past that's caused you pain, sorrow, rejection, scorn, all of these things. But what Jesus has done is he's made a way by the scarlet blood of Jesus Christ. And all you have to do is just the picture of the Passover when the death angel was coming to, to destroy the Egyptians and, and God said, mark your doorposts with the blood of Christ, the, the blood of the lamb. Just, just take a lamb slaughter and put the blood post over the blood over the doorpost. And when that happens, when the death angel comes, he will pass over your house and no one will be harmed in your house. It's the same way that you as a son and daughter, when you take and apply the blood of Jesus to your life, that scarlet rope, it doesn't matter what's tying you to your past because God's not concerned about your past. He's given you a way of escape through his blood. Even though your past says you're not worthy, your future says you are because the blood of Christ now covers you. When your past says you're not loved, you're your, your future says, no, I want to tell you otherwise. The blood of Jesus has me. When you begin to speak and think that I'm not protected, I'm not safe, I want you to know that the blood of Jesus says, I've got you covered. So apply that scarlet blood of Christ onto your life and know that God will never let you down. <clears throat> the Hebrew word tikvah. For scarlet rope, it means hope, expectation, ground of hope, things hoped for. So you have the shabel, which is sorrow, and then a different word that describes rope, which is tikva, which means hope, expectation, and that's our hope today, that Christ is not going to leave us in our pain. He's not going to leave us in our sorrow, and we can have hope today, a hope that surpasses our understanding. We have hope and great expectation that we have a deliverer. We have a savior. We have a healer. We have a redeemer. We have a lover. We have somebody that is on our side, and when God is on your side, the Bible says, who can be against you? Who can, right? So I close with this. There is hope of salvation. Rahab, known for her profession at the time, makes it into the hall of fame. And she asks these spies to spare her life. And in Joshua chapter 6, verse 22, Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought her out, her entire family, and put them in the place outside of the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasuries of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent out as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. What I love about this is a prostitute becomes a proselyte. A proselyte is simply a convert. She becomes a convert. And God uses this woman. And I thought, you know, when I read the Bible and I go, why do they keep calling this woman a harlot? Why do they keep calling her a prostitute? She did something great for God. And she ends up living amongst the children of Israel. She begins to learn their ways, and her whole family is, is living amongst the children, God's chosen people. She's living amongst them. And a man notices her. First Chronicles 2.51 says a man named Salmon, he was the father of Bethlehem. He notices her, and he marries her. He marries Rahab. Think about it. The father of Bethlehem. Who was born in Bethlehem? Ah, uh, Interesting. Rahab marries the father of Bethlehem. They have a child. His name is Boaz. Boaz marries Ruth. Come on, somebody, somebody just said, oh my God. <laughs> Bing. The light just came on. Boaz marries Ruth. 
They have a son named Obed. Obed has a son named Jesse. Jesse has a boy named David. David is the lineage of Jesus. David is the great, great grandson of Rahab. So Rahab is listed in this genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter one. The prostitute that everybody had just kind of turned their head against, she is listed in Jesus' genealogy because Jesus is a master at taking our imperfection, our brokenness, and turning it into something good. He's able to have to change our situation so that we have faith, and it changes your legacy. It changes your family's legacy. So don't give up. Keep standing. Don't hang in there. Hanging is uncomfortable. Stand in there is what the Bible says. People tell me that all the time. I'm hanging in there. Don't do that. It's uncomfortable. Believe me. Stand in there. And having done all to stand, stand therefore on the word of God. Stand on the promises of God and believe that through Christ, all things are possible. I will not give up. I will not quit. I will stand on the promises of God because all of his promises are yes and amen because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me? I wanna extend an invitation today. In this room, at all of our locations, there in the jailhouse, if you've never made a decision to surrender your life to Christ, today is your day, this is your moment to say yes to Christ. To say yes to this wonderful thing called salvation. To say yes to hope. And it's simply an indication, just remember, there's nothing you've done that Christ hasn't already paid the price for. He paid for the penalty of your sin. He's waiting and been longing to come into relationship with you. So if you're ready to come into relationship with him, on the count of three, lift your hand. One, two, three. Lift your hand all over this room, online, wherever you're at. Lift it high, boldly, unashamedly. That's it, fantastic, thank you. All right, you can put your hands down. If you lifted your hand or desired to lift your hand, we're all gonna pray a simple prayer together. There's no power in the prayer. It's just affirming what's already taken place in our hearts. So let together, let's all say these words. Father God, I believe that Jesus died for me and that he rose again. So I make a choice today to say yes. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. I surrender all. To follow you and I receive your love in Jesus name and everybody said amen come on can we give God praise for every single person that made that decision